uh, an interview with uh, the actor Alec Guinness. The very first night in Hollywood, I met James Dean. It was a very, very odd uh, occurrence. Um, I'd arrived off the plane. But those were, you know, it took a long time in those days, about 16 hours flight. And um, I'd been met by Grace Kelly and various people, but I found that I was alone for myself for the evening. And uh, a woman I knew phoned up and said, let me take you out to dinner. And we went to various places, and she was wearing trousers, and they wouldn't let her in any of the smart Hollywood restaurants. Thank you, you know, what it was, 1952, 54, something like that. However, we finally went to a little Italian dive, and that was full. And so one got turned away. I said, I don't mind just a hamburger anyway. I was hungry by then. And then I heard feet running down the street, and it was James Dean. And he said, I was in that restaurant. You couldn't get a table. And my name's James Dean. He said, will you come and join me? So we said, yes, very kind of him. And then going back into the restaurant, he said, before we go in, I must show you something. Um, I've just got a new car. And... There in the courtyard of this uh, little restaurant was a, I don't know what the car was, some little silver, very smart thing, all done up in cellophane with a bunch of roses tied to its bonnet. Uh, and I said, how fast do you, can you drive? And this is going to 150 of it. And I said, have you driven it? He said, no, I've never been in it at all. And some strange thing came over me, some almost different voice. And I said, look, I won't join your table unless you want me to, but I must say something. Please do not get into that car, because if you do, and I looked at my watch, and I said, if you get into that car at all, it's now Thursday, whatever the date was, uh, 10 o'clock at night, and by 10 o'clock at night, next Thursday, you'll be dead if you get into that car. I love Nonsense. So I had dinner, we had a charming dinner, and he was dead the following uh, Thursday afternoon in that car. It was one of those oh. odd, odd things. Where, where, where did, I mean, has it ever happened to you before? <laughs> no, I'm glad to say. And it was one of a very, very odd, spooky experience. He was not, I liked him very much, too. I'd love to have known, known him more. So if you remember, uh, Alec Guinness played Obi-Wan Kenobi in Star Wars. It, and, of course, the Jedi Knights, which Obi-Wan was, would have had that ability, the ability of precognition or a premonition. So I played that clip because we're just uh, starting out at this whole issue of precognition. So let's go on. For Alec Guinness, yes. As he said, it was the only time that ever happened, and he was glad that it was the only time. Because if you're not used to precognitions, it's kind of freakish. So... A, vor a version of precognition that I've been studying is called presentiment, which is looking at non-conscious forms of precognition, where you have a pre-feeling, a feeling about an event in the future as opposed to a cognition. So it's a feeling about an event or a vague sense of impending doom. <laughs> Doesn't that little dog look sad? And this, of course, is also the, the spider sense for Spider-Man. If the vulture is anywhere in the area, my spider senses will detect him. Aha, I'm beginning to get a tingle now. That is a precognitive sense, which he feels as a tingle. Um, this one, let's see if it finds this clip. If not, I know where it is. I know where it's hiding. Yeah, see, it didn't find that one either, but I know where it is. The unexplained aptitude of the few is difficult to clearly define, but its effect is borne out by hard data. In every armed conflict since World War I, just 4% of fighter pilots have accounted for 40% of total kills. These super pilots reportedly have uncannily accurate powers of anticipation. The military call this exceptional situational awareness. 
but it might be that some pilots are simply able to exploit the precognitive abilities that we, perhaps, might all possess. Some pilots have an innate ability to do this better than others. Whether you call that prediction or projection, I, I don't know what it is. I'd like, to, I'd like to think it was based on training, but there are some pilots who are innately better fighter pilots than others. Dr. Dean Radin is hoping that he can prove that what the pilots call prediction could in fact be precognition, a real ability to actually sense the future. His experiment records a person's emotional response to a series of pictures. The images are from an internationally approved clinical test for emotional response and are selected by the computer at random. Well, what we're expecting to see is that after a picture is seen, if it's an emotional picture, you'll get a large rise in skin conductance. And after a calm picture, the person remains calm, it'll, it'll continue to go down. So far, so good and unremarkable. But what Dean is looking for is what happens before the randomly selected picture is shown. We hope to see then is that before the emotional picture, skin conductance will already begin to go up, and before the calm picture, skin conductance will remain low. And if that occurs, then it shows that there's some aspect of us that is able to outguess what is otherwise a random process. If this happens, then Dean will have tangible evidence of an ability to sense the future. But for the experiment to carry any weight, the effect has to be observed consistently. Well, if it happens completely randomly, that's guessing. If it happens in such a way so that it is systematic, then it suggests that it's not guessing, but it's actually some perception of the future. Dean's analyzed the data from his experiments. This is the, sec the period before the picture appeared. And as you see, in both cases, you have anticipation of what you're about to see. They show that for three or more seconds before an image is shown, skin conductance does change consistently in anticipation of that future image. Incredibly, the blue graph shows that before a calm picture, the anticipation is calm. But before an emotional picture is shown, the red trace shows that the anticipation is emotional too. How can it possibly be that there's a difference in your anticipation for one, one thing that you haven't seen as opposed to another thing that you haven't seen? Well, that's the question, isn't it? We know that the laws of classical mechanics and quantum mechanics are time symmetric, which means that there is the, the direction of time for elementary particles uh, doesn't matter. And so the, you can then ask the question, well, what would happen in the case of consciousness? Since we don't really understand consciousness very well, could it reach into this domain where time symmetry rules, which is fundamental physics? So here's a moment of a stimulus occurring. The time symmetry would predict that whatever is occurring to the right side should be symmetric to some extent on the left. If time symmetry really does affect our experience of reality, then Dean might have provided an explanation for exceptional pilots. Though not everyone is happy with the idea. As an aviator, I can't predict the future. I can't know with 100% certainty where his aircraft is going to be. But based on my ability to understand orientation of objects in three dimensions, my ability and the training that I've received, I can get a pretty good idea, project three to five seconds down the road where his aircraft is going to be. You can make an educated projection or prediction about what is happening in a few seconds, but you can never know with 100% certainty. We have access to our future, at least to the near-term future. 
And by having access, I mean that we're gaining information from our future and it influences our present. You're driving along a highway and if you get a bad feeling, you probably ought to pay attention to it because maybe the bad feeling is relating to an event which is about to occur. And if you make the wrong decision on the highway, you could end up dead. That was uh, part of a uh, BBC Horizon show on um, this sort of thing. And so here's an example of uh, the same kind of experiment using pupil dilation. Uh, again, these are all unconscious reactions to what's about to unfold. So here's uh, IAN staff member, and that was named, uh, or is named Celeste, uh, and using an eye tracker where we can see her pupil and measure her pupil 60 times a second crosshairs say where she's looking, and we can superimpose that over the picture that she's looking at. And this moves around as her eyes move around. And if you do this experiment, uh, what we have are pictures that are randomly selected as emotional, pictures as calm, and we're looking at her pupil dilation. So when she's actually looking at the picture, her pupil dilates a lot when it's an emotional picture, but not so much when it's calm. And that continues even before she sees the picture, three seconds before. So this, this difference, it's a highly significant difference. That difference is what we call the presentiment effect. It shows a difference in your body reaction. In this case, her, her eyes, her pupils. Uh, so we see this in virtually every physiological me um, measure that we've looked at so far. So we do have, we have access to our future in some way. Uh, as of, yes. Is there research on longer-term precognitions? The answer is yes, mostly with precognitive remote viewing experiments, which have been done out to many, many months. And there doesn't seem to be any drop-off in the ability to do this. These experiments are on the level of seconds, primarily because they're based on physiology. And you, we don't want to wire somebody up and keep them in the lab for months. But in principle, it probably would work. Right. So the, the experiments that I'm, that I'm doing are not, you're not able to infer what the future is. What the pilot was talking about is uh, simply by knowing the way that, that combat is done in airplanes, so you can kind of guess that the airplane's going to end up over there 30 seconds. But what he wasn't talking about was those super pilots that still are able to, I mean, both, both pilots on both sides of the, of the combat are trying to outguess what they're doing. Sometimes some pilots are able to outguess even beyond inference. And so that's the realm where I'm looking at. It's the realm of looking at unexpected events in the future where you can't figure it out. So it, it, it involves information that's somehow leaking into your present. Yeah. The, the, Right. So the, the question here is precognition and psychokinesis seem to be the same thing from different directions. One is getting it from now, the other one's getting it from the future, or some, some weird combination like that. But in this experiment, you can test for that. So in the, the, the experiments involving pictures like this, there's a class of the pictures which are, are the emotionally arousing pictures, which are erotic. Most people, while they may not want to admit it in public, they like to look at those pictures. 
And so we could look later after lots and lots of trials to see whether or not those pictures show up more often. Because if we're, if we're making the future occur rather than, than having it impinge on us passively, then we should have more erotic pictures, less gruesome pictures, because nobody likes to look at that stuff, and probably less calm pictures, because who cares about looking at ashtrays and that kind of thing. But that's not what we see. In this experiment, you get the, actually the, uh, the distribution of targets that you'd expect by chance. So at least in this version of the experiment, you don't find any systematic influencing of what you see. Well, heart, heart rate has been looked at. And, of course, the uh, Roland McCready might talk about that. I'm not sure at this conference. But, yeah, so heart rate shows a deceleration before the emotional pictures, which is consistent with what you'd expect for an emotion. Uh, we've also looked at, um, at EEG, pupillary dilations, skin conductance, most of those things, but not respiration yet. And the reason why res respiration is not so good for a physiological measure here is because it's too slow. So it may well be that there's a hesitation in respiration. There could be a change in some way, which is reflected by all the other parameters, but we just haven't looked at it yet. I see. Oh, that's a good, that, that's interesting. Yeah. You had a question. No, the, the interval seems to reflect the time it takes to respond after seeing the stimulus. So for skin conductance, it takes about three seconds to see a response. So you look, we get the effect three seconds before. And the brain... Does that vary with the kind of picture? Not so much with the picture, but more with the, the physiology that we're looking at. So it may be the case that respiration changes, but it might change 15 seconds before because it, their, our breath rate is pretty slow. Brain waves change about one second because they're just faster moving uh, phenomena. Uh, the gut response is roughly 30 second cycles and it's, it responds, but a lot slower. So we're, we're dealing with different, uh, different physiological parameters that have different phases in them, different time scales. And that, so I don't, there's nothing magic about three seconds. It just happens to be a convenience in, the, in this type of experiment, yes. It is probably true that we're all psychic all the time. Uh, our bodies certainly show that in the laboratory. Some people who are talented are the ones who are able to bring it to consciousness at will. Uh, Roland and me are working on uh, development of a product for intuition training, specifically based on this presentiment effect. Uh, Roland actually patented the use of this kind of phenomena for use in intuition training. So we're working together on a product that hopefully will do that. Something kind of along the lines of a biofeedback system where you're using, in this case, heart rate variability uh, and changes in heart rate variability before different, um, different stimuli occur to train you how your body feels before an event. And so that, we hope, will go into that direction. So, yeah. Yes? Yes. 